Friday tonight. We have a very nice turnout. My name is Ed Levine, Lansing Town Supervisor, and I'm here to greet you uh, on this presentation tonight. I'm looking forward to the information that we shared. Uh, we have a few announcements also. We have some wonderful handouts in the back. Uh, please feel free to help yourself with that information at appropriate time. We hope to be out of here by 9, and my understanding is that we're going to try to get our presentation done by 8.30 so that uh, we'll have a chance for uh, questions and answers. Um, scanning this crowd, is there anyone from the Cuga Power Plant here tonight? If not, I'll try to represent them in case there's questions pertaining to that, if appropriate. Uh, there's a couple of other announcements going on. We have the uh, emergency preparedness uh, program scheduled for next week um, in this building, I believe it's 6.30. Um, they require 50 people to register. We only have 22 so far. So if you are interested in that, please sign up. There are posters outside on the bulletin board that will give you information to see how you can sign up for that. Um, and the other bit of information is that um, on the 4th Wednesday in June, I believe that's June 26th at 6 p.m., we will have representatives from the Cuba Power Plant come here and actually uh, give us information on the hopefully transition from the power plant to the gas center. So they will be here to give a presentation and hopefully they'll have uh, questions and answer time afterwards. So having said that, we'd like to be moving on our program. I'd like to introduce uh, Lauren Chambliss. Uh, she's a Lansing resident and she's a member of the Mothers Out Front were one of the groups that's responsible actually for presenting this uh, gathering tonight. So, Lauren, let's take over. Thank you. I have a pretty loud voice, so do I need to use this or can you hear me in the back? Great. Okay, so um, I'm here to welcome everyone to the Lansing Takes the Lead on Energy informational meeting and I think the reason I was chosen to speak is not because I've been the most active member <laughs> of this of the group of Lansing Concerned Citizens and Mothers Out Front but probably because locally I'm the most extroverted. So. <laughs> but I'm really happy to be here and to talk about how we got to this point and what we might think about as we move forward uh, with the power plant conversion and other important community issues. So this meeting, which brings together community leaders, residents, and energy experts, was encouraged and supported by Ed Levine, and we're so grateful for his leadership and that of the town board. We're all striving to bring a win-win situation to, and to, solution, to find solutions at the nexus of energy, economics, and environment. And this meeting is one step towards that goal, as are lots of other things that have happened in Lansing in the last few months. So many groups of concerned citizens throughout Tompkins County have been working on these issues for years, but it was really in the last year that a group of us locally in Lansing got engaged and joined the discussion and sought information when the Cayuga Power Plant talked about or put in plans to convert from coal to natural gas. And led by Sue Ruoff and Diane Beckwith, um, they sought help from Mothers Out Front an organization that works to mobilize local campaigns to preserve a livable climate for generations to come. Mothers Out Front, who, which is represented by Lisa Marshall, Lisa, where are you? There she is in the back uh, today, and she'll be talking a little bit at the end, helped us in countless ways to bring our concerns to local and state officials and also to raise awareness in our own community about the challenges and opportunities before us. I personally canvassed for the first time in my life um, on a cold day in February, primarily because I'm a grandmother for the first time, and I was motivated by that and wanting to work towards a future for her that is economically prosperous and environmentally healthy. So I braved my fear of knocking on my neighbor's doors and my embarrassment and also my great fear of big dogs chained up in yards. <laughs> and I was really surprised by of the more than a dozen houses that, whose doors we knocked on where people were home that only one person turned us away 
everyone else was really anxious to hear about what the plans were for the power plant, and this was before the data center idea had emerged, and to a fault, no matter what their politics, they were concerned about the idea of it converting to natural gas and the gas being trucked in on our already busy rural roads and right past the schools, as you all know. So my neighbors from all political stripes were like, are there other options? Are there other alternatives? And that's, I think, what, why we are here tonight. In addition to canvassing the Lansing neighborhoods in the past six months, I have to tell you a little bit about what Sue and Diane primarily, but working with others like Lisa Marshall did. And they held countless informational meetings at homes. They attended county, town, and school board meetings to gather information. They published a fact sheet circulated throughout the county. We feel our concerns are being heard, and together, as community members, as residents, working with town officials, working with others in the area that we can have positive solutions, such as turning an old decrepit power plant into a sparkling new data center. So one of the things we're united about is this idea that community involvement, community engagement can really make a difference. And that's what we're going to hear more about tonight. Our guest speaker is Claire Miller, who has traveled from neighboring Massachusetts to share her stories on the great positive changes taking place there, which we hope will also continue to take place here in Lansing so that we can really be not only a regional leader, but a national leader on working for really sustainable solutions. So now just a little bit about Claire. She is the lead community organizer and climate justice director of an organization called Toxics Action Center. Claire has a wealth of experience mobilizing grassroots engagement around climate and energy issues. I think she's going to tell you a little bit about how she got her start, even being concerned about these things and then devoting a lifetime of work to it. Currently, Claire provides organizing support, facilitation, and training to get grassroots groups all over the Northeast, teaching community leaders to plan winning campaigns, hone their messages and materials, uh, build groups, fundraise, garner media attention, and more. She's the founder and coordinator of the statewide coalition of 209 groups collectively known as Mass Power Forward, which has successfully advanced climate justice policy and fostered local clean energy campaigns. Claire's mobilizing efforts were instrumental in the community push in Holyoke, Mass, to convert an aging power plant to a solar farm. Holyoke's not a wealthy city, so like our town of Lansing, the need for new, clean, sustainable jobs was as high a priority as was closing the Mount Tom plant. The Toxics Action Center has helped communities like Holyoke all over New England retire dirty power plants responsibly and halt new pipeline and power plant projects. Today, Massachusetts is coal free. Retiring our Lansing power plant and converting it to something other than fossil fuels is a huge step in making our own beloved state a leader in this arena. So thank you, Claire, for making the trip to our community uh, to share your experiences and further our knowledge of what's possible when residents, business leaders, and town officials work together for a clean, prosperous future for our families and neighbors. And we're going to start by watching a short video, and then Claire will speak after that, give us a little bit more detail about the community campaigns, what they did and how they achieved it, and, and the, I think, the, how long it went on, right? Yes. <laughs> the, the sustainable effort that's needed. And then after, there'll be plenty of time for Q&A uh, with Ed as well. Okay, so thanks very much, everybody, for coming. Paper city. We have a history of immigration 
We're about 49% Latino. Hoyle had an active coal power burning plant for 50 years. Asthma rates in the city are twice as high as the rest of the state. It is possible to transition from coal to clean energy. When we first started this work in Holyoke, we never thought that it would be tit for tat, that we would literally be able to close a coal-fired power plant and redevelop a solar farm in its place. My name is Sylvia Brody, and I'm the executive director of Toxics Action Center. We organize with communities that are on the front lines of the worst threats to environment and health across our region. Toxics Action Center approached Labor Labor sometime in 2010 around a very interesting and important campaign to close a coal plant in the backyard of one of the towns where Neighbor Neighbor organizes called Holyoke. So we first heard about the Mount Tom coal plant when I was with Neighbor to Neighbor and we were organizing on a campaign to bring local jobs to the city. And we started talking about this, this coal plant that had been here for 50 years and it was such an eyesore. And I thought, you know, I don't know if we're really going to organize to shut down this coal plant. We're working for local jobs here. And then we had a community discussion about it. We have a problem very serious here in the city of Holyoke. There is a lot of contamination in the air. There are many cases of asthma. The air is so contaminated, mezclando much asthma. It's been a year and a half, four times in the hospital. to ask these very important and uh, critical questions. What's going to happen to the workers once the coal plant is closed? And then our members asked again, well, what's going to happen to the site? Right? Great question. It was really the, the folks on the ground from neighbor to neighbor that led the, the charge for a reuse study. And so the conversation became about what's the best real reuse that's going to benefit everyone in the community. Center, um, Claire Miller came out and walked us through a corporate campaign. Jimmy and Susan, they were playing very hard to get porque no quería cerrar su planta, pero no miraba lo que el daño que le estaba haciendo a todo lo alrededor, a los peces, a las personas, al ambiente y, y al aire y, y, a, y al agua, porque se contamina todo. And so we decided we had to escalate the pressure. And so we are coming. We sent them an exact date and an exact time to your office on this date. And you can meet with us and talk about it. Or we can hold a press conference outside of your office saying how you've refused to meet with us. And so we got a letter back from GTF Suez saying, we'll meet with you right here in Holyoke at the coal plant at the meeting. Vice President of North American Affairs, John Chu, says, well, we know, we've seen the writing on the wall, we may have to close the coal plant, we're considering converting to solar energy, but we don't know if we can make a profit. And Carlos said, are you kidding me? You've been making us sick for 50 years and all you can talk about is making a profit? News at 6 o'clock, the Mount Tom coal plant is on its way to retirement. The former coal-fired power station is being replaced with more than 17,000 solar panels, making it the state's largest solar farm. Ah, esa fue la noticia mejor que de decir. In the end, we, we did it. We transformed uh, the Mount Tom coal-fired power plant from coal to solar. And so we really saw, you know, our vision for a better world become a reality in Holyoke. It wasn't us in suits and ties, it was the people on the ground. Uh, they had their shirts, they had their neighbor neighbor shirts, and had their We Want Clean Air Now shirts and their banners. That's what was powerful, and that's what moved the needle. They got their retirement package, they got severance packages, and uh, State Representative Aaron Vega threw in $100,000 of state funding for job training programs for some of the younger workers. 
we're moving towards a clean energy future. We're committed to work with our community to make sure that everybody has energy that's carbon free and is green and is clean. And isn't going to hurt your children? Isn't going to poison our air? At every labor, we continue really holding on uh, to the promise that the way forward uh, is to organize, you know, to do like, exactly the work that we do, which is to go door to door and connect with people at the doors, hear their stories at the doors, pay attention to what they are saying. We have this incredible solidarity between Deeper and Toxic Action Center. I can't imagine having taken this on on our own. Aprendí que para uno lograr algo tiene que luchar. Si tú no luchas, no se logra. Who else is at work? 
concerned about their grandkids. Is that one of the reasons why you came tonight? Who else is thinking about contamination or pollution? I heard something about a lot of trucks that might have been one of the proposals. I saw a couple other hands. Um, yeah, uh, Well, I'm interested in um, seeing how we can make this transition without polarizing the community. Making the transition without polarizing the community. I respect that. Yeah. Uh, with your uh, solar power, I was wanted to find out what we, how did you plan for with the nighttime and when uh, the sun wasn't shining? What did you do about storage? Great question. We'll get to that. Yeah, let's talk about your hopes. What are some of the hopes that may have brought you here tonight? What are your dreams, your vision, your hopes? I hear about solar, what's, how, what can that can look like? Jobs. Jobs. <laughs> Something that has not been talked about a lot, but climate refugees. I mean, if that map up there turned out to be true, that nothing. Bangladesh will be gone. Most of India will be gone. That will put millions upon millions of people yeah. homeless. We think we have a problem now with Syria. Syria is going to Europe. <clears throat> Try right. multiplying that by a factor of 10. Right. Some of the research is that you know folks are leaving Central America because of drought. Right. Like all of our world's conflicts are also being stirred and made worse by. Our, our One more thing. We had an American desert once before. We can again. We're growing food on that former desert. If we have a new desert, we don't have food. So, so other hopes or dreams? I heard jobs. Anything else to know? Yeah. More tax revenue. More tax revenue, right? I'm the daughter of two public school teachers. I like tax revenue. It's good for the public education system. There was a hand over here I missed. That is the same. Yeah. Both for the towns, for the schools, and the roads. Yeah. And the It's important. Anything else? Resilience. Resilience. Say more. What do you mean by that? Well, the more of our energy we can generate locally, the more we help to stabilize the energy grid, not just for our own county, but around us as well. And that keeps us in a better shape or in the inevitable climate disasters that we're going to face these things we've already done, much less what might be coming if we don't yeah. do So by working to prevent more harm, we also increase our ability to deal with what's already coming our way. I like that. Were other folks, do you have a dream for, you're, you're hoping for tax revenue? Anybody else excited about that? <laughs> no hands, really? <laughs> And you had your hand up. Bring us home. What's your yeah, life? yeah. I, I don't live in Lansing. I live in Trulinsburg. Hmm. But um, you know, of course, I'm concerned about what the power plant would have done to the environment as a whole and to the lake that it sits on, which is directly across <coughs> from us. Yeah. And um, I'm now concerned about the coal ash problem that remains. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. It'd be nice if that could be cleaned up. Yeah, that's my dream. Yeah. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you all for sharing. We have one of I'm interested in your campaign and how you ran it because I've just talked to people in a lot of different places where you can't get people to move into Well, that is a perfect transition, thank you, um, for me to start telling you about our campaign. Um, so, just a couple logistical things. Um, my sense from my host is that we're going to try and save questions till the end so that um, I'm, we can have Ed or other folks <coughs> to help answer questions. So try to remember them as I go. Uh, if you need to use the bathroom while I'm talking, please feel free to take care of your needs. It's down in the hallway. <laughs> and if I am talking too softly and you can't hear me, um, please make like a hand motion like this. And if, it, if I do it too much, I'll start using the mic. Does that sound good? Alright, so I want to briefly tell you about Toxics Action Center, the organization that I work for based in New England. We were founded in 1987 after the Woburn Cancer Cluster. Have you ever heard about that happening? A couple folks, they made a John Travolta movie out of it. There's a book, a civil action. 
Long story short, there was a company dumping chemicals, got into the public drinking water supply, 26 kids in one neighborhood got leukemia, about half of them died. It was a wake-up call about how, you know, what, have, what gets into our water, what gets into our air, gets into our bodies. And so these mothers, these fathers, they ran into each other at Mass General Hospital in the kid's cancer ward and said, I know you, you live on my street. And they started putting things together. And as the story goes, if you've seen the movie or read the book, there was a personal injury lawyer who stepped up to help sue the bastards. Um, but what a couple of folks in Massachusetts said is, that's great, but there should be an organization that's poised and ready to help those people organize, run a campaign, get the you know, government to hold these folks accountable, pass laws. And that's why Toxic Action Center was founded. It was to fill that hole, to be the sort of 911 crisis hotline for everyday people who are trying to protect the health of their neighborhood and their families. So that's our mission statement. In a nutshell, what I do is I drive around southern New England, and I meet people around their kitchen table in their church basement, um, and I give training, advice, coaching on how to run and win campaigns. So I've worked on, this is, I'm gonna talk about Holyoke mostly tonight, but I've also worked on um, two other communities with coal fire power plants, pipelines, trash incinerators, you name it, I've probably worked on it. Um, so I'm excited to, to tell you more. So you saw in the video, uh, Mayor Morris give you a little take on Holyoke. Um, it is one of the poorest cities in the state. It's a planned industrial city, so that's why there's the canals. Um, and it's you know, really tr struggling to make sure that they have the tax base that they need. This is Carlos and Rosa, who you also saw in the video. Um, Carlos has actually since passed away, uh, since this video was made. Uh, that kind of, and you saw the rest in peace at the end. We had multiple leaders actually pass away from respiratory diseases over during the course of the campaign. Um, but they were, they were community leaders who neighbor 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 Massachusetts, the organization you saw in the video. And they asked Toxic Action Center for support. So, this is me, looking a little bit younger. Um, and the first question is always, when, a, when I'm working with a community, is what are your goals? What do you want to see happen? What are, what's the point of doing all, going to all these meetings and knocking on doors, let's have a vision. And the thing that came out of that conversation was that they wanted to close the plant sooner rather than later. They also wanted the city to be ready when that happened. They didn't want to be blindsided. They didn't want to see, you know, teachers have to be laid off. Um, so prepare the city for that loss of taxes. They wanted to support the workers. They knew some of those folks. They, even if they didn't know them, they still cared about them. Um, everybody, you know, Carlos and Rosa understand what it is to be underemployed or unemployed. And so they're, from the get-go, it was like, we got to talk about the workers and see what we can do here. And then lastly, the contamination. We'll get into this later and I'll go into more detail. Um, I've tailored my talk tonight to talk more about the reuse time because that seems to be about where you all are at. Um, but there's a lot of coal ash on that site. So that very first step, um, getting, making sure that the city was ready. So we worked with city councilor Rebecca Lisa, Lisi, um, Aaron Vega, who you saw in the video, he was actually a city councilor at this time. Um, and we were like, you know, we should have a task force. We should have a group of people, you know, like associated officially with the city who are, you know, it's their job to go figure this out. Um, so they wrote a city council resolution and we got it passed unanimously through the city. Um, it was our, you know, very first thing is like, we gotta get ready. We gotta get people to see the writing on the wall. Um, so that was our kind of first victory. And then we worked with the mayor to get the dream team assembled for this task force, this transition task force. So we wanted people who understood public health. We wanted people who understand energy. We wanted people who you know, are thinking about the community in every aspect as, we, as we're visioning for this reuse. So you know, land use comes in handy. The school was clearly on people's minds. 
Um, so these are the types of people that you know we're dreaming up. Um, of course, we had to figure out you know, who are the actual people. Um, so this is uh, our dream team wasn't exactly how it panned out. Um, <laughs> but the job description, you know, of, of this kind of task force is really to to work with the owners, right? It's it's their business. It's their private property. Um, they get to do with it what they want. Um, but the truth is that. And I see this in all the campaigns I work on, that big business, you know, big business in a town, they want to be good corporate neighbors. And it's in their interest to have the, you know, the host community like them, be cooperative. You know, it's easier for them to exist and, you know, get the permits that they need over time or change their operations if, if they're, you know, on good relationships. So, we knew that, you know, if we made up this committee, got the city's kind of like stamp on it, this is actually the city of Holyoke reaching out the olive branch, uh, that they would likely respond. We wanted to pursue funding for a professional reuse study. We'll talk more about that. We wanted this transition task force to actually hold public hearings as part of the process to actively solicit from the community, what do you want to see happen here? And then lastly, make sure they're communicating back to the community, here's what's happening. Um, to pay for that, <laughs> right? Reuse studies cost money. Um, our state senator, Senator Michael Knappick, he's the guy on the right there at a forum that everyone's looking at. He actually got money allocated in the state budget. Um, so you can see the legalese language there. It was no less than $100,000. I, I was like, wow, that's a lot of money. And he's like, in the state budget, it's like a drop. <laughs> it's like not actually that much money. I was like, oh. <laughs> like, seems like a lot of money to me. Um, so that was a really kind of wonderful boon there. And then, you know, the task force had to figure out, okay, we're getting this grant through the state to do this reuse study. Now we have to interview consultants to figure out who we're going to hire. So the whole time, uh, which stands for Action for a Healthy Holyoke, that was the name of our kind of coalition effort. The whole time, they're supporting the task force when, they, when they're like, we need help, what are we doing? Um, so this is a picture of the site, just to give you a sense. Um, that's the Connecticut River, and there's the existing So I'm going to, I decided to go down into a little bit of the nitty gritty here because I thought this might be more interesting for you all around the, the <coughs> reuse study, uh, which may or may not be something that you all want to pursue. But, you know, we really wanted to see, like, what are the specifics to this site? You know, I had talked to a community group in Chicago who had uh, redeveloped their whole plant, but they had like a fiber optic cable. Like going right by their coal plant, and so it became like something. And I was like, we do not have that <laughs> in our coal plant. So it became kind of clear, like, oh, like, you know, every situation is a little bit different. So you have to actually understand the challenges and the opportunities that are related. Is there, you know, a rail that goes by? That's how the coal would get to the coal plant. That's an interesting opportunity. How can that help us? Um, and then they created these reuse principles, so things that they would use as they were evaluating different scenarios. So um, the community spoke and said, we want it, we would like it to be multi-purpose. Um, you know, we'd like to have more than one thing on it. If possible, we'd like to reconnect the community with the river. It's a really beautiful river. They definitely wanted to generate new tax revenue. They wanted to go <coughs> green and then use the existing infrastructure where possible. Seems like pretty good principles, right? There's some pictures of the community conversations. There are these different facilitated community meetings. And then ultimately, these were the scenarios that the consultants went deep on after sort of listening and hearing. So large solar installation, large solar installation with a public amenity, like a rail trail type of thing. Um, solar, the anaerobic digestion, which is a 
sort of like composting, but not smelly. <laughs> uh, Large-scale, non-smelly compost. <laughs> Um, maybe some opportunity for community gardening, and then, you know, again, that public amenities, maybe they can be a park. In, all, in each of these scenarios, they looked at, looking at that, and how much would it cost? Because the cost is a big element here, right? Um, so they, they analyzed it with the demolition of the building and without the demolition. Because the building itself, I mean, it was from the 50s, had asbestos, the smokestack has had contaminated pollution going through it for 50 years, so it's also pretty contaminated. So that was one of the economic impact pieces. And analyzing for what's the employment opportunity in these different scenarios, what are the tax opportunities, because those are really important. Just to give you a sense of the type of contamination we were dealing with, uh, there are 21 different ash fill areas. Um, so, you know, if you think about when you barbecue, Right? You end up, if you do charcoal barbecue, you end up with some ash at the end. Same thing with burning coal um, to make electricity. So you, they had it for a long time just been dumping that on site. Um, and that's pretty, um, it's pretty dirty stuff. Under the Obama administration, it was considered like deeply hazardous waste. I think, I think the Trump administration reclassified it. Um, it also, been the former dump just for the plant, uh, for whatever trash they were generating from just working there. Um, and then for a little while it was also the dump for the city of Holyoke. So a lot of dumping happening. Um, and it was interesting because that was one of the clear things that the group members were really concerned about. Um, some of them, a lot of them were Puerto Rican immigrants had seen contaminated sites in Puerto Rico be left for decades and never be cleaned up. So they were like, I've seen this before, we do not want that to happen here. Um, and so we looked into it, you know, right from go. It was kind of fascinating um, the way that there had been a cleanup site plan, but because of a rare species, um, it had gotten really slowed down. And so by having the community being like, hello, state of Massachusetts, what's going on here? They're like, yes, yes, we're on it. Right, so that community involvement moved the cleanup plan along. All right, so that's a lot about the process that was happening at the city level. Um, at the end of the day, the ultimate decision maker, though, was the owners. It was their, it was their plan. They could decide. Um, and so that's what we call, in the organizing world, a corporate campaign, where you have to convince a corporate player to do the right thing. So we did a bunch of research, like Googling GDF Suez, never heard of them before. Turns out they're a multinational corporation based in France. But their website is all wind turbines and like pretty, you know? <laughs> and I'm like, huh, okay. And then I'm like looking in all of their other assets in our region, we're all we're all small hydroelectric. It's just stuff that I support. So I'm like, okay, they have this one dirty asset that's not really making much money for them because it's not running very much. Um, this is sort of like their ugly duckling, right? <laughs> like, so that was what we call our strategy, El Petito Feo, if anybody speaks Spanish. Um, that's what we called it, that we wanted to reach out to them and say, we see you have an ugly duckling, let's work together to transform it into a swan. You know, you're not making money on this, coal is on its way out all across the country, let's work together and make our interests aligned. So this was the launch of that um, coal foreclosure, as I said, um, and was kind of shown in the video from the very first day, we were always writing them <coughs> letters to say, we'd like to meet, to talk with you, we want to work with you. Um, and they stonewalled us for four years. Um, that's a multinational corporation for you. Um, so we tried, you know, kept building up the local pressure. We talked to local business owners. Uh, this is actually one of my favorite things to do as an organizer, is to go reach out to local business owners. You just walk down Main Street and you talk to the barber shop, the pizza shop, the auto body, and they're, you know, everyday people in your community 
but they have a little bit of prominence because they own a local business. Um, so we got more than 60 owners in Holyoke to endorse our campaign for this responsible retirement and you know, sort of amp up that pressure, saying if you want to be a good corporate neighbor in Holyoke, you've got to come talk to us. You've got to work with the transition task force. So the workers. Um, so the, I should say, the union was never, the IBEW was never really excited about our campaign. And I do not blame them. Right? We were trying to shut down the coal-fired power plant. They knew more than anyone that it was on its way out. They were barely running the coal plant. Um, and so because we cared about their jobs, um, we would just tell the press and we would tell everyone, whatever the union wants, that's what we support. That's what we support. Because we didn't know what they needed. Um, we learned later that because it was a local, mostly older workforce, uh, they mostly did not want a transition to a new job. They just wanted to retire, right? I can, I can totally understand why that would be what we wanted. So um, later on, we started just sort of echoing that. But just from the beginning, we're like, whatever they want. Um, to help give them um, a boost uh, from the outside, we actually reached out to other unions. So you can see the Mass Nurses Association, the SEIU, the United Auto Workers, Massachusetts Staff of Justice, all this labor <coughs> community. We tried to kind of hold up, you know, shore them up from the outside to say, we've got you. We care about you. We see that this coal plant is on its way out. We're trying to transform it into a swan and we want you to land well as that happens. So uh, this is the, the thing described in the video um, where after a while, you know, the task force was going, the reuse study, they hired a consultant, they're doing these community meetings, and you know, Carlos and Rosa were, you know, you know, were like, I cannot believe the company still won't talk to us. Like, it's kind of unacceptable, <laughs> right? Like, we are bending over backwards to serve them up on a silver platter, something that would work for a win-win-win. And so um, I got the job of going to Hartford, Connecticut, which is where their regional headquarters was, to knock on their door and just walk in and hand deliver this letter, saying, it's been four years, we've asked very nicely, many, many times to meet with you, and you know we've had enough. So we're coming on October 8th at noon. You can have a conference room ready and sit down with us, or we'll see you on the sidewalk with the TV cameras and the, you know, the banners. And as Lena said, we got a response right away going, we'll meet with you. We'll come to you. Don't come to us. It's cool. <laughs> Um, but, you know, it's like, sometimes you just have to twist that arm just a little bit. And in that meeting, you know, we communicated, they talked about, you know, getting our help to advocate for solar, um, to make sure that they could get the subsidies. We told them that we were excited about that. They also wanted us uh, to be quiet about cleaning up the contamination because that's expensive. We told them no. Um, sorry, we have high standards. Um, but about six months later, they went public. Um, and I have to say, this is one of the things in this campaign, which is true, was, has been true for many of the campaigns I've worked on. They said, we're not closing, we're not closing. And then the next day, we're closing. They kept it, like, the information very close to that. So, um, you know, there's something kind of like, you just have to keep plugging away and have like that faith that you know when you build, build that community voice and you make sure that you're united in what you're calling for that it will pan out so we got the first thing close the coal plant um, and then we you know we still had the other pieces clean up the land support their workers transition the site So simultaneous to all of that campaigning, 
The task force is still going. It's having all those meetings. The final report comes out. Ta-da, they're recommending solar. It was not a big surprise to us because, you know, at these community meetings, that was the resounding thing based on the analysis, the tax base, the jobs that people really wanted. Um, so this is that same graphic where you can see, I should have pointed out before, but those are the, those are the solar panels on the site. They had to think about a lot of different pieces here. This is a very flood-prone river. Um, I think they wanted to do more solar panels, but you have to leave, um, you can't like, pave over all of it, because otherwise the flooding is worse. And then things kept getting good. In 2016, we literally popped a bottle of champagne uh, with the solar groundbreaking. In 2017, the panels were done, and they started generating power into the question to the man in the beige suit. Um, in 2018, they added a battery storage. Um, so literally just a giant battery on the site so that they can store the energy for if it and then use it at nighttime when the sun is not shining, for example. And then lastly, I wanted to say that not everything got tied up in a bow. Um, you know, the, there's actually still, the mayor is still on the company because the smokestack is still standing. Uh, they did commit to demolishing it, um, but it's still there. So, you know, the cleanup, they said from go, like, this is at least a two-year job. Um, that building, like I said, it contains asbestos. It's going to take special removal. The boiler, which is those um, four column type things, those were demolished in November of 2018. There's a bunch of videos on the internet if you want to watch the demolition of a power plant. Um, we just put some strategically placed dynamite. Um, but the smokestack is still there, and that is still something that community is pushing them on because they want to see the site fully transformed. And that is all that I had prepared to share, um, and my timing is impeccable. <laughs> um, so I'm keep question and answer. How big is the battery? How big is the storage? How big is the battery? Yeah. How long can it I don't know. battery? I don't know. Sorry. I'm not a, I'm not a technical person. Okay. I can answer a lot of questions about campaigning. Okay. Um, but I can, I can be happy to get back to you. As I understand. I, I am so smart. It's on my side. Yeah. No, that's the size of the solar. Um, all I know is it's the biggest in the state. <laughs> Good question. Other questions? Yeah. Hi, so you're saying they did eventually clean up the coal ash and, and the company paid for it? As yes. As part of the transition. Yeah, so the company is a responsible party. Um, and because I also work on brownfields, often companies will try and say, oh, we're bankrupt, this subsidiary can't pay for it, bye, let the state pay for it. Um, that did not happen. Um, I'm not 100% up to date on how far the cleanup has gone. Um, I do know that it's taken extraordinarily long in having the community checking in on it, saying, why is this still there? Why is the smokestack still there? has been key to keeping it going. Were there special tax incentives or things that uh, convinced the company to do this, that the solar could be profitable? So the question was, were there special tax incentives or other, <coughs> or other things to make the... Yes, yeah, so the state of Massachusetts at different times has had different solar policies. Um, that was one of the things that they asked our help on, um, was to go advocate at the Capitol for um, SREX, which stands for Solar Renewable solar. Energy Credits. Thank you. <laughs> uh, which is something that, but they changed, honestly, that policy has been changing on a yearly basis, but at that time it was part of what made it possible. Yes? Where did the solar, where did the uh, coal lab go? Yeah. Yeah, so that's a really good question. Yeah. So, hazardous waste, 
Um, the best thing that you can do to it is send it to a certified, deeply <coughs> lined and protected landfill. I know, it sucks. There's nothing really visionary you can do with toxic things like PCBs or, uh, or coal ash. It's better than having it on the banks of the Connecticut River, which floods every year. <laughs> um, but, yeah. Uh, you had a question? Yeah, could you go a little further detail on describing how you put together the, task, the citizen task force? Yeah, so... When, uh, is there a particular piece? Well, I mean, you, uh, you suggested that you found people who were, had particular expertise, who had special skills to, to contribute to, to, so that you would cover, um, you know, all of the, the issues that were involved in this. And I just wondered, yeah. what, what, how did you, how did you find these people? I mean, or did they just step Carlos up? and, and Virginina and, and Rosa, I mean, they had lived in their community oh. for a very long time. Um, they also, through the campaigning, came to know a lot of people who were interested in this type of thing. So, I mean, some of it was just asking around, saying, you know, who could we trust to go to bat for us and advocate to this company who could just show up, you know, close it up and walk away, or trans, you know, turn it into an LNG to a gas plant because that was also an option in Holyoke, and they also would have had to truck it, because there's no pipeline that goes along the Connecticut River. Um, and so, you know, it was a lot about, you know, who can we trust to advocate and know, you know, be able to see through, ask the right questions, um, you know, this type of, when they say, oh, don't push us so hard on the contamination, it's not such a big deal, to be like, it's actually, we actually care about that, sorry. Um, so, I'm, uh, one, of the, one of my, you know, an element of my question is, how do you deal with the different personalities of the people who are, do, who are involved in that? Um, yeah. That would be tricky. So the question is, how do you deal with the different personalities uh, involved in that? And with as much grace as possible. Okay. <laughs> uh, I will say that sometimes they asked one of the members of the campaign to help facilitate and keep the thing on track. Okay, so there was sort of some, some, someone who was kind of supervising that. Yeah, process. yeah, someone had to, you know, set the agendas and make sure that people were coming out to the meetings, because most of these folks were not previously, you know, on some sort of town committee. Mm -hmm. It was very citizen-led, very I grassroots, yeah. um, and so, you know, having someone who was familiar with, you know, open meeting law. <laughs> Um, who could help, but ultimately it never would have worked um, if it hadn't, you know, had that heart and soul of the community in it. You and the Neil. Could you go back to the storage slide long enough so I can get a picture of it? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. You had a question? Yeah, it sounds as if, um, the way you tell it, that the town was really on board for closing this down. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, was there a substantial opposition? People who felt that, you know, they would never have the tax base that they needed, you know, to close it down, were there people who really wanted to keep it? So the question is, it sounds like our city was really on board. How real was that? <laughs> and was there opposition? Um, in the, at the beginning, we had no idea how much the tax base actually was. Um, and like I said, you know, Carlos and Rosa, they, they were concerned. They don't want to see it just go. And, and so we looked into it and did the research. And Aaron Vega, who was the city councilor at the time, helped us, you know, actually understand, like, what's the, um, what's the mechanism? Um, it's called, in Holyoke, it was called a pilot, which is a payment in lieu of taxes. Um, and so it's like negotiated. And it turned out, um, and I've got a sense it's similar here, that it had gone down drastically. Yeah. And so when we said, oh, like, is this actually going to be a big deal when it closes? They were like, they were, you know, they were like, well, it's kind of already not that big a deal. It used to be a big deal. And for other communities that I've worked with, they've 
had, you know, coal plants that were like half of the town's budget, and that is a big deal. Um, but we kind of figured out there's not a lot of opposition to the closure, but there's a lot of anxiety around what what's going to happen, where's it going to go, and that was the thing that we had to um, really mobilize and get you know this process going where people could feel like we're going to figure this out together. Did that answer your question? Yeah, but there was real awareness of pollution. Yes. Yeah. I mean. Holyoke has a really high asthma. It's in the valley, um, so the, the pollution tends to hang in the air. Um, and so, you know, for for Car you know for Rosa, she was going to the hospital multiple times a year just for having asthma attacks. When they learned about the coal plant, they were like, "We don't care if it only runs ten days a year. That is ten days too many. It is. We do not need the extra air pollution." Uh, particularly when they layered onto that and figured out that there were other ways to make electrons like solar panels. Uh, I'm going to call someone I haven't heard from. Yes? Uh, I saw on the slide that you said that there, there was a proposal to go from coal to natural gas. And what, can you, can you talk a little bit about that and what it was like to um, you know, address that issue. Sure. Yeah, so I have to say it wasn't super viable for similar reasons that I sort of learned about here around the trucking piece. Um, so the Mount Tom Coal Plant is called Mount Tom Coal Plant because it's on the side of a mountain, um, although mountain in Massachusetts. <laughs> it's like a hill. <laughs> uh, but it was between Mount Tom and the Connecticut River. And then there was also <coughs> Route 5 um, in this railroad. So like it was sort of surrounded and constrained in a lot of ways. So because they actually were like, can we build a pipeline, you know, to get natural gas up here? And I was like, no, definitely not. It would have to be trucked in. Um, and that pretty much sunk it right away. People were just like, we don't want, you know, something like, are there other options? Let's look at other options. That seems like not a, not the best way to go. Yeah. The company, the company did. Um, you what know that. The question? Oh, thank you. The company was uh, the question was who actually paid for the installation in the actual panels, um, and the answer is the company did, and that was you know that was the whole thing of the campaign was how do we find the Venn diagram between the interests of, you know, Carlos and Rosso who want good jobs, clean air, a tax base, the interests of the town who wanted to, you know, come through this unscathed, and the interests of the, of the, of the company. They have this old, dirty coal-fired power plant that's frankly got to go sometime. And they need to figure out, what, is it just going to be a stranded asset? Are we just going to have to close it? Or can we make it into something else? And finding the intersection of those three circles ended up being solar. And then, you know, once you have, then it was like getting, you know, support for um, any of the permitting that's needed at the state or the local level. It's like, let's do it. Like, green light that stuff. So I was I was just going to ask a question that sort of feeds off of hers. Um, so you, you could, clearly there was a segment of the population that was really impacted impacted by that, you know the health problems. Was there a portion of the town that was oblivious of their suffering, unaware of that? Um, um, I mean, maybe not against obviously not against those people, but just kind of apathetic. Absolutely. And, and, and how were they brought on board, or wasn't it, was it just not even necessary to get that many people involved? Do you know, uh, the question is, um, was there a part of the city that was oblivious, and did, you have to, did we have to get them on board? Sort of what, what happened with that? Um, and yes, there was definitely a part of the city that was oblivious. Like any community, there are different neighborhoods that have different feelings about each other. Right. Um, you know, what area code are you in or whatever. Um, 
And ultimately, I would say that we didn't have to do a ton to get them on board. Um, I don't know if you if you know that Margaret Mead quote about you know a small group of people can change the world. It's really true that you know when you get a, a critical mass, it doesn't have to be the entire community, but a critical mass of people who care, who turn out, who show up, and are engaged at you know on at the local level, go to the you know, select board meetings, the city council meetings, it, it can be enough um, to really show what's needed. Because a lot of people, you know, like Lauren was saying, like it takes guts to knock on doors, and that's not for everybody. Um, but they received and they listened, right? A lot of people are sitting there going, I don't really know how to get involved. I'm not really sure that's for me, but I'm really glad someone else is doing it. Um, so there's, there's, there can be a lot of latent support. <laughs> a transition task force would take and that type of thing. Um, I mean, I think my short answer is that in really in any sort of giant, you know, big development, it's good practice for a community to do its due diligence, to you know, read the documents, ask the questions, say, you know, what's the downside of this? Um, could you do it slightly differently? Could you you know, put in a provision for local hiring. Could you, you know, have an electric, uh, sometimes a lot of communities I work with ask for a community benefits agreement. Um, sometimes they ask for, you know, diff different tweaks, but really getting in, getting in there and advocating and saying, you know, I don't know about this. Can you get an independent expert to really explain this to me? Because I need to make sure that I can explain it to my neighbors. Um, it's that sort of liaison to make, because, you know, your city government, um, I don't know about Ed, but most folks are already like doing a lot. Um, and so having a transition task force can be really helpful to give that added layer of, of oversight and um, due diligence. May I comment on something? Um, sure, we've got a couple other hands. Uh, you they can ask all the questions at some point, though. If you want, if not, okay. anyway, you can do it yeah. the next time, do some background on things. But, um, Why don't you get up and so yeah. I can hear you. So a couple of things. First of all, <coughs> congratulations. It was a wonderful thing you Thank did. You. Um, and I think that the ground was fertile to have that happen. The situation is a little bit different. I don't want to take away any thunder because it's all well earned. Um, but they're already a willing participant. In your case, you had to maybe sensitize them that this could be a symbiotic relationship, not a parasitic. Uh, some background on the power plant, um, 10 years ago it was 160 million and we always talk about cumulative because if you lose it the first year, you lose it the second year. Cumulatively over the last 10 years it went from 160 down to 20, that's 937 million dollars of assessed value. At roughly 30 dollars a thousand, that's 28 million dollars that the town of Lansing lost. And that is two thirds, well that, that's this tax revenue. Two thirds of your, is your school, roughly. That's 66 percent of that. 28 million. Uh, 26 percent of that is your county. Your town is five. Your uh, let's see. Your fire protection is two, and your library is one. If you live in the village, you're now at another one percent. I crunch these numbers all the time, as far as that goes. When I got elected, I was looking at 60 million dollars that that plant was going to lose. We didn't know what the pilot was going to be, and my gift was the first first three months was not only did we have miners trapped a miles away of training, which, which they handled it quite well, also the shops of Ithaca went down 10 million on top of that. So it goes from 60 million down to 20 million, that's 40 million, only 40 million, shoulder shrug, shoulder shrug, no, that's not. Do, do the math, it's 100 million. Do 25 the first year, you go 25 the second year, 25 the third year, that's 75 million, 
you go 10 million a second year, 10 million a third year, that's another, that's 95, third year it's five, that's 100 million dollars, okay, of tax. Who, who basically absorbed that? You guys did. That's how it happened. Plus, we scrambled to get as much building in here as we can. Remember the Lansing's open for business? Go down to the south end. All those buildings are worth about 1.4 million that Mr. Lusani's building right now. It's, the situation is that we are at the point where they're willing to listen. they have already starting to talk with the Newark Power Authority about their allocation now for the power. Now we're on the second phase of that, the willing participants. What we can do as a group, for once, we can all agree on something and not fight over everything and maybe move forward together because if the tax base goes up, the other concern I have is the schools because the schools are one of our, business, our, our busiest and, and best businesses we have. And if the schools tend to go down, we're going to lose everything that's drawn here. 71% of the village is rentals. And there are over 3,000, about 3,600 people live there. Ask Don Hertel. I talk to them all the time now. We have such a great relationship. All these things come to play, but what can we do as a group is we can find ways to initiate as the governor in Albany talks to uh, the, the power company to get the allocation of the power. The power is 100 million megawatts, okay? That power plant is 330. Somerset's 250 megawatts. They are now going to turn in from a power uh, a producer to a power consumer in huge fashion. As far as the uh, storage batteries go, they last about five years. Dairy One has one, to give you a little idea, where they have one behind there, their plant up on Warren Road. And I don't know how many millions of dollars they cost, but once again, okay, New York State, you want to go in this direction, pony up also, okay? That doesn't mean, though, that they get a free ride either. They also have to hold your feet to the fire and say, are you going to take care of these employees? I don't know. My hope was I could hang on long enough and keep these guys going so some of them could at least get off of the ship onto the light post and retire before it went down. I lived through that, 58 years old, 50 minute phone call. I'm out of a job. I had to work for the company for 18 years and I'm 58 years old. Good luck with that. So I lived that. I don't want anyone else to live it. It's terrible. They say they don't discriminate against age, but okay. Okay, that's what they say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I got lucky because the, the, the store I helped built up, they actually brought me back. And because I'm talking to my boss who's half my age, I thought it was a very interesting conversation. So I said that to get back to this, because sometimes I use these geometrical uh, conversations with too many tangents here. The bottom line is what can we do? <coughs> Look at the information sheet that's back to get accurate information. And when we have the presentation in, well, another month, don't see them as ad ad adversaries, see them as partners. The first thing I, I, when I meet with people, I say it's a new day. And we hope you make more money than you ever dreamed possible. They think I'm joking. Because if they make money, as I talked to Diane Beckwith about this, if you give them a reason not to go into other areas, they'll stay there. I'd like to show you a picture. I wish you were here two years ago. Because this was two years ago. We had a nice presentation there of everything, how they tried to turn that plant into solar. They were willing participants to do that. And what it was, it was 18 megawatts and 75 acres. Now what they plan to do is they plan to use the same footprint, and they only have about 200 acres that they actually can do this out of the 453. Uh, because of the slopes and everything else there, okay. So of that, they roughly are gonna have uh, 75 acres, 15 megawatts. <coughs> Those 15 megawatts, they plan on, and I'm not going to hold their feet to the fire, they plan on using storage batteries also for that. And their plan is not to, I'll say hopefully their plan is, because they don't have anything in writing, is that when the batteries kick on, it won't be at night so much. It'll be when, when, when the peak hits in August and you don't burn everything out. The other thing we can do, in all fairness, is go to nice thing and say, you know what? We need a reliable grid, and you need to pay for it. Bottom line, you need to pay for it. And we've lived through that in Lansing in January, in February, and March. We had unreliable power this last year. So all these things are noble ideas as far as heat pumps. I get it. I'm a scientist. I get technology. I get the little phones we have now as opposed to big computers. I get all that. We need inexpensive, 
reliable power is what we need. And if the grid's not going to hold it, the grid needs to be fixed. So I just want to correct one thing or reframe. I, I do not want to say that GDF Suez was an adversary. I'm not saying it was. I'm simply so saying that in the past, the way that the city needed to engage with them is exactly the way it is as a partner. They're a corporate neighbor, right? I mean, in our in our instance, we had to convince them to come to the table. You're not having to do that, um, and I hope that they do everything right by you guys. I will share one cautionary tale. In Somerset, Massachusetts, which had two coal-fired power plants, the hundred-year-old one had committed to close on its 100th birthday. Then it came and they said, you know what, actually, I think we want to burn construction and demolition and solid waste instead. So yes, they are your, they are your partners, they are your neighbors, but until it's set in stone, I highly recommend that you that you read, you know, the, all the fine print, make sure all the D's are, you know, T's are crossed and the I's are dotted. Um, and to me, that, that was what the role of that task force was to make, to be that advocate, get in the weeds, because it is deep. <laughs> and it sounds like you've got, done some of that, you're like in the weeds on some of that. Well, I'll be the first to the door, because this yeah. is their opportunity. Their yeah. opportunity, they've done this project already in another state. Yeah. And this is, you can do a field trip, see how they're treating those guys. Well, the first thing I'd ask them is they show how you went from, as, as you did, yeah. from the outhouse to the penthouse. And how do you do that? <laughs> yeah, they got to clean this one. There you go. Oh, yeah, they got to clean this one. I'm back with you, though. Um, did they clean up the ash? You know, and I don't, once again, I can't speak for them what their plan is here. I only hope that we look as an open mind because as we transition here, just imagine it's more than just a data center. I mean, you talk to some people at Cornell, they need, they need reliable fiber optics is what they need on top of that. Maybe you talk to Ithaca College. You have a great intellectual base here. I'm looking at a lot of them right here, in all fairness. Why not tap into that and do something different then try and do the same thing cheaper and fight the person next door for the same bone. Why don't we be innovative as we have this town the last three and a half years and do other things nobody thought of? This is the opportunity to change the whole dynamics of that end of town as opposed to lying just on the southern end with all the building. Because when the rentals pop and the bubble bursts and there's no more rentals, where are we going to go now? A lot of people are going to leave if they're not leaving already. That would be just a shame. I saw a handful of more hands. Um, you and then you. I just, what I'm getting from Ed is that when you, you were saying you had to get that company to come to the table, I think for us, we have another table that we need to maybe go to, and that is the New York State Power Authority and things like that, that I think we might need to look at those sorts of, of things in addition to. But, you know, keeping track of what Cuba Power, the company that owns them, is planning to do. Yeah, that, you know, that, that so, we have to look at it also for what else can we do in the community right. besides the power plant to keep our community growing. Well, so, but that's, right, sorry, but that are, so that's the, the analogy to our situation in Holyoke was that they said to us, we need your help with the, the solar, Credits. Right. So they're, my understanding is they're asking for your help in getting this power allocation. Like assuming that you all love the data center, go to, right? Mm -hmm. Like help get it here. Um, get, in, so, get in the ring and make it happen. So let me give you an update on that too, okay? This is CJ Randall. She's our full-time planner now. Yay! And uh, we, we've had a phone conference with her. Uh, with the uh, representative from, from NICA, New York State Power Authority. Everything is going to be acronyms now, so bear with us as we fill these out here. We go into politics, everything's an acronym. So <laughs> NICA, New York State Power Authority, we reached out to the, the representative of, of that and talked to them directly. And now there is conversation going on between them, NICA, and uh, I believe, and, the, and also the, the power company. So that part, what we can do is this is what you can do is what we've done in other projects. 
Give me somebody who are the champions, are the, are the point people on this, for email so that we can, you can CC everybody back and forth. Get the email chain going. We can feed you information on how to do this, whether it be a petition, whether it be, we have letters of, of uh, support that are there. It's a form letter. We can do whatever you want. But I want to give you accurate information and work through Jerry at the power company. Say, Jerry, what do you need from us to help this go along? Or talk to the representatives of NYPA. What do you need for us to show we're really serious about this? And have those people reach out to the rest of you so that we have a constant circle going back and forth. And we'll share the information as fast as we can. Like I said, you have a printout right from the power company representative themselves right there of the facts. So that's one way we can do this. So as soon as you heard about this, we asked Jerry, are we okay? We're not going to mess up any negotiations? No. So we reached out to him automatically. You had a question? Yes. So for you to come in as an organization, uh, does the group have to have a grant to be paid you? Or how does that work? I'm free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, no, Tax Exaction Center is a, a nonprofit. We fundraise. Any questions? Thank you. The question was um, to get assistance from Tax Exaction Center, does a group need to have um, a grant or money? Um, and the answer is no. Um, like I shared, you know, we were founded to help like the families in Woburn at no cost. Um, so we do fundraise, we ask folks to consider making contributions, but we raise our own grants so that I can show up wherever I'm needed at the turn of a dime. Um, you know, you've got a pollution problem, I will be there. It doesn't matter how much money you have. Because they're you know, kind of organizing, and, and it's, it's difficult to get a straight up. There's a lot of people here, you know, there's not enough air time for everyone to say what they're thinking. And to get a direction and know what the next step is and to carry it out and see and then evaluate, did we do it? It's, it's a process and it's not just let's do it. It has, it has to be organized. And yes. so that's where you come in because you have the history and the, and the uh, expertise and experience. Yeah, that's the dream. Um, so I didn't catch your name. Cindy. So Cindy's describing how getting that type of you know communication going is a lot of work. Um, getting you know community consensus is a lot of work. Um, and so that's yeah, having someone who ha has experience, whether it's me or or mothers out front. <laughs> Uh, or someone else, it is very helpful. So one of the things is that if the information isn't in the back uh, for your group, is you can share it on email, you can distribute it to people if they want to donate to that, yeah. to that group. Yeah. I always like to raise money, so. Thank you. Feel free to. <laughs> feel free to uh, become a member of Tax well, Center. Well, <laughs> it's all about organizing and about how we can share that, so if you like the work she does, you can make a donation to that group also. Led um, task force that you had. Um, obviously, the local government played a role in that, but it was like, sort of average. It was citizens in the community mm -hmm. that participated in it, if I'm understanding correctly. Yes. And so, did they, um, were you able to get like a, a, what degree of transparency were you able to get in terms of um, talking with the company and also regulators? So the question was, the task force was citizen, rooted and led, yes, and then given that, how much transparency were we able to get from the company slash, um, like the state? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think because it was so clear that the task force had the buy-in, it had the ability to turn people out, it had the credibility of not only the municipal government, but also the grassroots leaders, um, they sort of felt like they had to do right by, by them. Uh, so did we get perfect stuff? I don't know. I can't claim that. Um, but I do think that, that having that type of um, committee just makes it so much stronger when, uh, when someone is saying, you know, I'm a resident of Lansing, I'm part of this official committee, and I have this expertise, and I want to know why on page 32, on paragraph 3, you said this. Because, you know, most people don't have time to do that. <laughs> um, but having a group of people who have the kind of the trust in the heart of the community was so <coughs> crucial. Um, so that people really felt like the end product was the right end product. Yeah. Was this group, this task force, appointed by the town? Yes. But largely, you make suggestions to the town and then they appoint you. But it was yeah. an official yeah. 
checks uh, had an official municipal function. Yeah, so the question is like an advisory group. Was this an official committee? Yes. So we passed it by city council resolution. So they, you know, wrote a thing, whereas, 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 therefore, you know, so and so shall do such and such. Um, the, because we were friendly with the mayor, he asked us, who do you think should be on this? And we said, oh, well, we think, you know, so and so happens to live in the community, has, you know, planning, um, you know, background. Um, so and so who lives in the community is respected because you know they have a background in watersheds. Uh, so it's just like broadening it because there was the anxiety was high, um, broadening it to, but also having that like we're officially part of the city. That combination was really helpful. So let me address from a town supervisor standpoint as opposed to the mayor. Um, you're already in many ways on phase two, which is they're convinced they need to go in that direction. Uh, put a task force there, there's a task force to do certain things for support to get this across the finish line, absolutely. There are negotiations right now for the allocation of, of power, which they hope to get from hydro, by the way. Um, that I think we should back off from, because the last thing I want to do is be the uh, reason they don't do it. Uh, because people can create failure just as much as they can uh, success. And I learned from my mistakes to be the second mouse. The second mouse gets the cheese, not the first. And there's a lot of enthusiasm in how he wants to do that. And I want to be more patient as a supervisor to do that and to see where this goes for the negotiation. I think that the fly ash question is a valid question. I think that the status of the, of the employees is a valid question. Yeah. on that. Is it going to be uh, predicated that they uh, do that to, to get this? I don't know. How much leverage does a town have? It's a business. Right. And what's the worst case scenario? Read mm -hmm. item 10 on the sheet. They go to court. They don't get this. They're going to go to court and say, we tried everything else. We want to come back and fire this thing back up. Our job is to, at least my job, is to be have a symbiotic relationship and say, how do we get you in a different area so that you can grow, and maybe we get 10 more Dutch mills up there. And that's where your Seth's value really grows, is with your businesses. Um, so that's why I love the enthusiasm here. I just think right now, and I'm gonna lean on you a little bit for this, for your guidance in the future, is that, okay, how do we hone that into what we need to do, not what's already been done? You yeah, know, I mean, you, you guys know, have to decide if this makes sense for where you're at. Um, you know, hopefully they get this allocation and you don't have to worry about it. If, what happens if they don't get it? You know, I mean, you have to decide what makes sense for you and your community. Um, and I'm happy to be on call to give any sort of insight that I might have. You're the experts on your community, though. Um, and I'm going to toss it to Lisa because we are at time. And it's, um, I'm happy to stay after and talk with anybody. Can we have another round of applause? For thank um, Ed Levine for uh, offering to host this great event and thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, transition is really hard. Uh, I moved to this area uh, after my husband retired from the Navy so we had to transition all the time. We, our whole life. Uproot ourselves, find everything new. And that's a very hard thing to do. So the way that I coped with that as a military spouse was to imagine what my future life would be in the new place and that helped me make it real. So I would look at maps and I would look at houses and I would think, find, find chat groups where people were talking about that town and find, read about the schools and see if I knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody who lived there and then I would call them. The point is in order to make something real, you have to be able to imagine it. And I think that for me, the purpose of having this meeting was for us to help imagine how to help actualize this transition that has been proposed and make it be a win for this community, make it a win for the company, and make it a win for the climate. 
Um, and so that's what um, I'm so glad that we're here, and I think that this is a great beginning of how we can continue to work together to actualize that reality um, moving forward. So please put in your calendars that um, June 26th, the company will be here, and um, between then and now, we should probably do some community work about thinking about what um, we want to ask the company and what questions we have um, and what input we want to give them. And we want to also think about, is it important for this community to have a task force that helps inform that communication um, between the municipality and the county, the state, and the community and the, and the company. So there's a lot of work to do, um, but we're really excited to have this opportunity to do this work. And that's partly because of all the work that a lot of us in this room have done to get us to this point, everybody in this room. So, um, that, so, um, and I just also want to make a personal announcement. I am a community organizer for Mothers Out Front, but only until the end of business on Friday. And after that, um, I will be coming back to Lansing in um, July to be the Heat Smart Lansing coordinator. So I will be here, um, one of those people lurking quietly and politely at the back of the room to give people information about, um, about Heat Smart. And I'm going to encourage all of you to stick around, to talk to Claire, to talk to Ed, talk to me, talk to um, everybody at the back of the room. We have people from um, Nexam, um, Heat Smart, and Mothers Out Front, and I think maybe, I, I thought Snug Planet was going to be here, but I'm not sure. Oh, there you are. Okay. So, um, so please stick around for a little bit more casual conversation, but, and I'm going to let Ed close this out. I also want to really especially thank um, our Lansing folks here who organized this event, um, so Sue Ruoff and Diane Beckwith um, and Lauren Chambliss, so thank you guys. So I want to echo the thanks to everyone who really organized this. I get way too much credit for this besides unlocking the, the door. That was my contribution. But uh, having said that, I think there's a lot of good energy here. The thing I would recommend is you look at what is on there, the information that the, the power company has, has offered, and you think of constructive questions. Uh, I would also ask that you keep the attitude positive because I always look for partners. That same attitude has developed a, a sewer district between the three municipalities of, of Village Cuga Heights, Village of Lansing, and ourselves. The relationships have been, have been as good as ever because we work together. I want to leave you with a vision um, and plant the seed. Hopefully I live long enough, even through modern technology, to see this happen. But just imagine, as when I was in the pharmacy school back in the late 70s, you had, for $100, a calculator. And I use this example many times. It ran on a 9-volt battery, and it added, subtracts, and multiplied, and divided. And, and, and divided. That's it, for $100. The technology now is you run it off the sunlight, and you off of room light, and you get a free program of a checking account. Just imagine our solar panel technology being that far. And with this any type of technology, once the next breakthrough comes through, just like stints are for, for your heart, the next breakthrough comes through, it revolutionizes everything. So having said that, let's say that the power company is no longer a power company, but it has solar. And let's say from the solar, it goes to Eva Droll and says, you know what? You got 480 some acres up there. We want to buy it. And where the farmland is, which isn't very good, I've been told, we're going to put more solar panels up there. So we can, we can keep going with this data center, take more off the grid, and become a better and better partner for the environment. And just imagine they say, oh, that wooded area, by the way, we're going to give that to Lansing. And you can have it as a park. It's all yours. You don't build on it, you take your kayaks down there. It's like Salt Point on steroids. You'll be fine with that. <laughs> Look at what you've done with Salt Point. You've turned that from UC Point, which some of us remember, which was like uh, Dodge City, over into Salt Point. And for people who are here, you should be commended for that because your energy is really shown in a positive way. So I'll plant that seed with you to just imagine maybe 10, 15, 20 years from now,
you have a vibrant company with a lot of other satellite industries thriving off that, your tax base is high, your taxes are low, your people can stay here when you retire, and the kids that grow up here actually stay here rather than moving to Cuba County or someplace else and not be one of the 11 to 15,000 that has to migrate in every day to work in Tompkins County. Wouldn't that be nice? It's all because you actually will be a part of that. You can tell your grandkids, we want a different direction. Rather than button heads with each other, we said, you know what? If we all pull in the same direction, we can get something moved. So I'll leave it with that. Thank you all for, for coming out tonight. <laughs>